My name is Sister Anne Hammersley. I'm the assistant chaplain here. Monsignor Paul Grogan isn't able to be with us tonight, so he asked me to introduce Brother Guy Consul Magno. I have a feeling that you will all know who he is, but sufficient to say that he's a Jesuit and an acclaimed astronomer and works at the Vatican Observatory headquarters in Castle Gondolfo, where's the, where he is the curator of the largest meteorite collection in the world. Brother Guy, we're privileged to have you here with us tonight to deliver your lecture entitled, Would You Baptize an Extraterrestrial? <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction, and normally I'd let it pass, except it's not the largest collection in the world. Um, arguably, that would be at the Natural History Museum in London. <laughs> and since there are locals here who might be able to catch me on that, I have to, to correct. It's one of the largest. I'm here giving this talk, which is for me the first time I've actually given this particular talk in public. So you're all guinea pigs. And it's a talk based on a book that is in process right now. It's, it's being printed. That's a proposed cover for the book, whether it will actually look like that or not. I'm not sure yet. The subtitle, Other Questions in the Inbox, means we're going to talk about more than just extraterrestrials in it. This talk is just extraterrestrials. I also have a co-author there, Paul Muller, who is another Jesuit in our community, He's actually a priest, not a brother. He is somebody who has studied history of astronomy and history of science and philosophy of science. So I've stolen all sorts of really good ideas from him. The origin of this book, however, is actually this book, which came out about 10 years ago. And I've updated some of the material here, but I'm going to start today's talk the way I started that book which was published here in London by the Catholic Truth Society. And it starts with a hunch. A lot of people think that science is all about facts and logic and, and religion is somehow you know, very emotional, as if we we're all divided into Kirk and Spock. But in fact, science depends on hunches. And I've got a hunch. I can't prove it. I can't be sure I'm right. I could be wrong, but still, I've got a hunch that sooner or later, sometime in the history of the human race, we will discover that there are other intelligent creatures out there in the universe. And part of my hunch is based on science. There are already more than a thousand confirmed planets orbiting other stars, and we've just started to look. There are billions of other stars to look for in our galaxy alone, and hundreds of billions of other galaxies just in the part of the universe that we can observe. You know, to quote Carl Sagan, if we are the only people and the rest of the, of the universe is empty, it sure is a waste of space. <laughs> part of my hunch is not scientific. I just have this comfortable familiarity with the idea of aliens probably because I've read way too much science fiction. Um, part of it is simply aesthetic. I'm not the first astronomer. I'm not the first religious believer to see all of these stars in the universe and feel that it would be inelegant of the creator to have not used some of them. It's a hunch. But the first and the most important fact we have to address when we do deal with this topic is, we don't know. I have not seen any convincing evidence of ETs. If there were convincing evidence, we'd all be talking about it, and we're not. What's more, there are a group of people who are some of the most trained, well-trained observers of the sky who are out night after night with really good equipment, who know the sky better than any of us in this room, unless you're among them. And I'm referring to that wonderful community of amateur astronomers. 
and they are among the most skeptical of the idea of UFOs because they've seen what's in the sky and they're able to identify all of the wonderful things that sometimes surprise you if you're not used to looking. So I want to just, you know, set this right now. No, I don't think there's ETs. I'm not, I don't have any secret knowledge. I don't know anybody who could keep that kind of knowledge secret. And that means that everything we can possibly say about the ETs is speculation. It's guesswork. Some of it's going to turn out to be wrong. Maybe all of it is going to turn out to be wrong. We don't know. So why do we even bother talking about it? For the same reason that you came to this talk in the first place. Because we human beings have always found the topic fascinating. Stories about other races, other creatures, are as old as the Iliad and the Odyssey. Ancient Greek and Roman myths were populated with gods, with heroes, with demigods, with all sorts of strange creatures. It made the stories fun to listen to. It satisfied something in our human soul, looking to find out and communicate with the other. Lucian of Samosota in AD 160 wrote what might have been the first known story about travel to other planets. And he imagined other races living there and imagined leading wars there and having the same sorts of adventures. In other words, trashy science fiction dates back to the ancient Roman times. Even the Bible talks about non-human intelligences created by God. We call them angels. But even in medieval times, speculation of people in other worlds was common. This is a quote from a book by Bishop Nicholas of Cusa, 1440. Most people in those days thought that the Aristotelian universe was the best description of how the universe worked, in which case there was only one logical place for solid material to exist at the bottom of the universe. Nicholas of Cusa speculates, well, for a number of reasons, I conclude that the Earth cannot be the center of the universe, cannot be devoid of motion, and if it's not the center of the sphere of, of, of fixed stars, then we must survive that all of the other stars must be places like our sun with maybe planets and other inhabitants. The one universe has so many parts that they are without number except for him who created them. Medieval times, 1440. Incidentally, they made him a bishop after saying that as opposed to uh, people who say, oh, the church was so afraid that they were dreading you. No, no. If they burned Giordano Bruno at the stake, it was for plagiarism, for stealing this idea 200 years later. But there's another reason. Imagine if you were interested in trees, but you lived on a desert island and you only knew one tree. Would you be able to say that that thing on the right is the same kind of thing as that thing on the left? We all know when we travel how coming home is the best part of traveling because you now see your hometown in a completely new light when you recognize that, hey, you know, the light switches go up in some countries and down in some countries. People drive on one side of the road in some countries and on the other side of the road in other countries. People have some really strange idea of what to have for breakfast in some countries. It's only by seeing the other that you appreciate what is common between us and what is unique and special about us. When you'd want to talk about the human race, a great question is to, is to ask, human as compared to what? And so the exercise of thinking about aliens is a great way to reflect on who we ourselves are. There's another reason, and there's another reason why a whole lot of people want aliens to be out there. I don't know if any of you have seen this marvelous movie from the 1950s. Um, the robot is under the control of, of uh, uh, Gort, I think is the 
Gord is the robot. I don't know if we ever learned the name. Klaatu, 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 but it, no, yes, yes. Klaatu takes the name of Mr. Carpenter. He's come to Earth to act as a savior. Carpenter, savior, you get, get the connection. It also doesn't have a happy ending. But somehow I think there are people who think that, you know, the UFO people are going to solve all of our problems for us, that they're going to be the savior. If we've already had a savior. Look what we did to him. Nonetheless, there is that hunger, that hope, that at least having the perspective of another race will allow us to see ourselves and maybe, you know, maybe if they're nasty, we'll all join together to fight them. And not a particularly good reason to want them to be, to be aliens. I would just assume not have that kind of event. But this highlights what might be the deepest value of contemplating and speculating about life elsewhere. Looking at this topic from a religious perspective adds a new dimension to our own understanding of what it means to be in a relationship with God. Appreciating God as the creator of this universe, this enormous universe, gives us a sense of how big God is. When the, the writers of Genesis talked about their idea of what the universe looked like, a flat plain with a dome over it, water above and below the dome, bigger than that, bigger than the eye could see, was the God who created it. And that was bigger than they could imagine. Now we talk about a universe of 13.8 billion light years to the edge of what we can see. And if you add in inflation, 150 billion light years to the edge of what we know at one time was in contact with us. And God is bigger than that. And if there are any number of multiverses, God is bigger than that. To contemplate on that puts into a really interesting perspective what God's presence on earth means to us. There's two, you know, two, two alternatives. You could say, in a universe that big, it's absurd to think that God actually pays attention to me. I'm so tiny on a world of seven billion people. That's one of billions of worlds around hundreds of billions of stars. How could God pay attention to me? Or you could say, the fact that God does pay attention to me tells me something about you know, I, I, I throw off the word infinite. We're talking infinite. How really amazing God is. But we must never forget that what we're doing here is speculation, contemplation, appreciation. It isn't science, not yet. It may not ever be science. It actually isn't even theology. Because at best it's science fiction, fantasy, poetry. It's a lot of fun, precisely because we don't know. If we don't know for sure just yet, when are we ever going to find out? When will we find out if there are extraterrestrials? To understand a little bit about what goes into trying to find alien life form, uh, we might want to look a little bit about where astronomy is at the moment when it comes to studying alien life. What do we know from our science today about life? Well, we can speculate about a lot of possibilities, but it's important to make clear what it is that we actually do know. Intelligent life does exist in the universe. That's astonishing enough when you think about it, but it does exist on at least one planet, planet Earth. So, if you could find any other planet that was like planet Earth, there would be a candidate place to look for intelligent life. It may not be the only place to look, but it would obviously be the first place to look. So, what do we mean like planet Earth? What do you need to have life? At a minimum, we know that life as we know it, animal life as we know it, requires food and shelter. 
Food is some way to provide the energy that drives the interesting chemistry that goes on in our bodies that keeps us alive. And shelter is the protection from all the things that can kill you. And there are a lot of things that can interfere with your life and kill you. The energy of your life that we know of is chemical energy, specifically the energy that comes from some pretty complicated chemical reactions based on the element carbon, but also involving water and nitrogen as essential ingredients. Everything that animals on Earth consume is based on carbon-based organic chemicals, plus water and a little bit of salt. Liquid water, in particular the salty water of the oceans, is the ideal medium to allow this life to continue and to make this chemistry continue. To make the chemical reactions go, you put the energy back into the chemicals once they've been eaten and turned into fertilizer. Well, then you need some source of energy that will drive the chemistry in the other direction so that we can eat those animals or eat those plants and make more fertilizer. Sunlight is what does that on Earth. Sunlight powers life on the surface of the Earth and therefore drives, ultimately, all of other life. Because even if I stay in the dark, if I'm eating some animal, that animal got its energy from eating another animal, which got its energy from eating some plant, which got its energy from the sun. In the deep oceans, we actually have found life forms that get their energy not from sunlight, because it's so dark there, there is no sunlight, but it gets their energy from hydrothermal vents. But even there, that energy depends on the existence of free oxygen dissolved in the water, and that free oxygen comes from the top of the oceans, and it was turned into free oxygen by the effect of sunlight on plant life. So even in the deepest oceans, there is a necessity for sunlight to make the, the chemistry go. That's the chemistry we know. Is there possible to be chemistry we don't know about? Of course it's possible, but we don't know it. Let's start with what we do know. The things that kill life are many and varied. If it's too hot, if it's too cold, you can disrupt the chemistry of life. That's, you know, another reason why you might look for water, because boiling water will kill things, freezing water will kill things. So if you find a place where the water is liquid, you know you're in a safe temperature range. Extreme radiation, like cosmic rays, that'll kill you. Ultraviolet radiation emitted by a lot of stars, that'll break up life. Breaking the energy chain can starve the life to death, so that if you have an impacting comet or a nuclear war that suddenly covers the atmosphere with darkness, and then the sunlight doesn't reach the, the surface, lots of animals, like dinosaurs, are going to die. But even there, some animals might continue on. So we'll have cockroaches after the next nuclear. And the other inter interesting thing, of course, is once you do have a system of life, that life can feed off of each other, sometimes to the point of extinction. Uh, someone once said to me in a very cynical way that the human race and all of our pollution, we're going to kill ourselves off for the first time in history. And I go, actually, it's for the second time in history. The original life on Earth was, was uh, life that thrived in carbon dioxide, but it produced this poisonous oxygen that eventually killed it all off and made us possible. The point of all of this is that there is a convenient setting we know about in the universe to grow life, the surface of a planet that orbits a star. The planet should have an atmosphere and maybe a magnetic field to deflect the worst of the bad things that kill stuff. It should have liquid water in the surface, which means that it uh, should be not too close to the sun, not too far from the sun, what's sometimes called the just right zone or the Goldilocks zone. It means that the star itself should be relatively constant in how much energy it gives off. It can't be a wildly varying in brightness star, and there are stars like that, or a star that em em emits enormous amounts of radiation periodically. There are stars that do that. Earth is such a place. And obviously, there's life on Earth. And obviously, we can't draw any conclusions from that because if there weren't life on Earth, we wouldn't be here to know about it. 
We only have the one example. And that's what's so frustrating. Because so long as we only have the one example, we'll never know for sure which of all of those things I've lined up really are essential in which ones is nature clever enough to get around. That's why we'd love to find life in other places. But the first question you're going to ask is, are there other places in the universe like Earth? And how many of them are there? And how many of them have life? That at least would give us some way of you know, doing the odds. So the first place you might think of to look for other places, we know there are planets around our sun. Some of them are in regions that, you know, might be a logical place. After all, if you want to be in the Goldilocks zone, if you want to be in the right distance from the sun to have the conditions for life, well, the Earth is obviously in the right condition. How about the Earth's nearest neighbor, the moon, which is exactly the same distance away? Uh, no life. It's bone dry. Even though it's right next to the Earth, it has a totally different chemistry. Why is it so dry? That's a different lecture, and the answer of that lecture is actually the same as the answer to this lecture. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the next place you might think to look are the nearby planets, Venus and Mars. Uh, Venus is covered with really, really thick clouds in, and an incredibly thick carbon dioxide atmosphere. The result of all that carbon dioxide atmosphere is to create what they call the greenhouse so that the sunlight comes in, gets turned into heat, the heat tries to radiate out, but all the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere stops the radiation of heat until the planet gets really hot, like about 700 degrees. Uh, is that Kelvin or Celsius or Fahrenheit? It doesn't matter. 700 degrees. Celsius, actually. So you'd say, ah, impossible to have life there. You might ask, you might ask, why is it that Venus has such a thick carbon dioxide atmosphere and the Earth doesn't? Interesting answer. The Earth has basically just as much carbon dioxide as Venus has. The difference is that all the carbon dioxide in the Earth got turned into seashells and turned into limestones by animals in the ocean that sucked that carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and used it to make their little mollusk shells, which then fell down to the bottom of the oceans to make these layers of limestone. And that didn't happen on Venus. How curious. You might also ask, 700 degrees on the surface, clouds of sulfuric acid, which is what happens when you have temperatures that high and no water around, uh, you know, does not sound like a pleasant place. It, it's you know, like Los Angeles on a hot Sunday afternoon. <laughs> the tops of the clouds, which are many, many miles above the surface of Venus, have a temperature of 300 Kelvin, which is the temperature in this room, and a pressure about the same as the pressure in this room. And those cloud tops are droplets of water, along with sulfuric acid. There are biological entities that we now know of, extremophiles, that could survive in those droplets. For all we know, it could be possible that there is bacteria living in the tops of the clouds of Venus. We can't rule it out. I can make arguments as to why I don't think it's likely, but I can't rule it out. Stay tuned. The next most likely place, uh, that's not Arizona, that's actually Mars. Sometimes hard to tell the difference. Um, Arizona's got more atmosphere, which anybody who's ever been to Arizona knows what a joke that is. I live there part of the year. Venus was covered with these really thick clouds. Mars has way too little atmosphere. It's just a little bit smaller than the Earth, small enough that a lot of its atmosphere, a lot of its carbon dioxide went away. 
We can tell from the surface that it used to have liquid water on the surface. It used to have a thicker atmosphere, and it doesn't anymore. But here's the curious thing. If you scrape a little bit of that sand away, you don't have to go very far down before you get to layers of dirt and water ice. And that water ice, if it was raised to a temperature, could boil up enough to create an atmosphere. So if you could make Mars warm, it would be warm. That's not as foolish as it sounds. If you could make Mars warm enough to melt the subsurface ice, the atmosphere created would be thick enough to hold the heat, at least for a while. It is conceivable that we could turn Mars into a place where we could live through some kind of terraforming. It's also possible that even though the surface of Mars is so exposed to, to cosmic, uh, cosmic rays and, and solar ultraviolet radiation that it's basically being sterilized, you don't have to go very deep before you wind up in a region under the surface where the water could be liquid, that's well protected, where you could have bacteria. We haven't looked closely enough at the surface of Mars to rule out that possibility. We haven't, you know, for all the, the rovers, including this rover that took these images, we have not yet been able to measure to a high enough precision what the surface of Mars is like. There's a plan for a rover to go in 2020 that might be able to look for the traces of organic chemicals maybe made by life. Once again, Stay tuned. But at the moment, no life yet that we know of. Well, those are our closest neighbors. But actually, there's some other interesting possibilities. There's Jupiter. Um, one of my, my favorite enemies, Carl Sagan, who is a crazy American astronomer. I don't know how many people here would have heard of him. Yeah, if people of a certain generation remember him because he was on a lot of TV shows. He died about uh, 20 years ago now, and you know, younger people don't know him that well. I knew him when he was young and enthusiastic. I knew him when he was a TV star and utterly insufferable. <laughs> and I also knew him at the end of his life when he was dying and he knew it, and he was a much more humble man. Uh, it was kind of it was sad, but what interesting to see that, that change in him. He had an idea in the early 70s that the, the cloud tops of Jupiter with all those colors, maybe those colors are due to organic chemicals, again, floating in the atmosphere on the droplets of water. The best measurements we've made since then show that's probably not the case. But there is something else next to Jupiter, a series of moons. There was a uh, brash graduate student, master's student at MIT in about 1975 who first made models that you can see like that by calculating the amount of heat inside these moons that said, you know, the moons could have a solid rocky core, but an ocean layer and then an ice crust. Um, the model's predictions have all been confirmed by the spacecraft. The details he put into the models have all been shown to be wrong. But all the errors canceled each other out very conveniently. At the end of his master's thesis, he wrote, I stopped short of predicting life in these oceans, leaving that for others more, you know, blah, 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 blah. He was thinking of Carl Sagan, of course. I know he was thinking of Carl Sagan. That was me. I am not the first person to predict life in the oceans. I'm the first person to specifically not predict life in the oceans. But the life might be there. OK, there's no sunlight. Actually, I'd mentioned this to Carl Sagan, and he said, how is the sunlight going to get through the ocean crusts? There could be volcanoes you know, and, and, and lots of thermal heating, as we see on Earth, down at the bottom. But without the life, without the oxygen creating oxygen, or without the sunlight creating the oxygen from the water at the top, the life as we know it couldn't run. You need some way, some kind of cracks through that ice covering. Do you actually see cracks through the ice coverings of the icy moons? Uh, yeah, actually you do. This is the moon of Saturn called Enceladus. 
Those are plumes of water erupting from the South Pole. And in fact, these plumes of water erupt enough droplets of water that they form a thin ring, one of the rings of Saturn, not the, the famous rings, but a ring there nonetheless. In the last year, we have seen evidence for plumes like that above Europa as well. So at least two of these icy moons are showing us that the water exists under the crust and it is in contact with light. There could well be intelligent tuna living down there. Now imagine, if you will, that you're an intelligent tuna swimming in the oceans. You're living in a universe where there is a bottom because you swim far enough down, you hit the, the rocky core. And your universe has a top. You swim to the top, and there's a crust. And all you can do is swim around and around and around. And there is no way that you can observe that the rest of the universe exists. Until one day a crack appears in the surface, and you get erupted up, and you realize the universe is full of stars, but that's just before you die. I'm not saying this is what really happens there. I'm saying reflect back on us. What is it about our universe that we don't know and that we don't know we don't know? Just as the intelligent tuna would not be able to conceive of a universe that has something beyond the top or beyond the bottom, what is it about the way we understand our universe that limits our imagination of what might be? But that's an open-ended question, and there is no possible answer to it. It's a question for contemplation. Those aren't the only icy moons. This is a radar image that's been colored up of the moon Titan, which is a moon around Saturn. Titan has an atmosphere twice the atmosphere of Earth, which is not so much greater to make it unlivable. It has lakes. You can see sunlight glinting off the lakes. You can see the lakes in radar. The only difference is that the clouds are methane, not water, and the lakes are liquid methane, not water. And the temperature there is around 60 degrees above absolute zero. Could there be some kind of life that thrives under those conditions? We don't know. Can't rule it out. Remember, actually finding life is going to be very difficult given our technology. Even though there are lots of places where life could exist, all of them are places where it's going to be really hard to find it. At the moment, the only place we know that has life is Earth. Now, in the last 10 years, we have discovered thousands of planets around other stars. This is a chart showing all the different types of, of planets. Those that are hot, too close to the sun to have life as we understand it, are then the top. Those that are cold, too cold to have life as we understand it at the bottom. Those that are in the habitable zone in the middle. And then, which ones are rocky and which ones are gas giant? Now you'll notice, most of the ones on the chart, 1,744 as of about two months ago when this chart was made, are super Terran hot planets. And the next largest are the hot Neptunes, or the hot Jupiters. And that's simply because those are the easiest to find. Planets nowadays are found by looking at a star and seeing the brightness of the star drop ever so slightly when the planet passes in front of it from our point of view, which means all the planets going around this way around stars we never see. And it also means you want to be able to see the planet repeat itself three or four times before you're convinced it's really there, which means if you're only being able to look for a couple of years, you could only see the guys that are orbiting close to their sun because they're the ones that cross the, the face of the star most often. 
they're the easiest to see. Even under that constraint, there are a couple of dozen possible Earth-like planets. And again, one in the news a couple of months ago that is not all that much bigger than Earth and in its Goldilocks zone, for all we know, it could have life. It's 500 light years away, so if we send a message, um, you'd have to wait a while to get an answer. Worse than that, if they're looking at us, they're seeing us the way we were 500 years ago. You know, we could get to see Shakespeare live anyway. <laughs> could any of these planets have life? Could any of the giants, even if they're close to their sun, have icy moons, and inside the icy moons, there's life? We don't know. We don't even know how you get the chemistry of life started. We still haven't figured that out yet, and we've been working on that for 50 years. To say, God did it. You know, I'm a scientist. Okay, God did it. How did he do it? That's what I want to know. Given all these uncertainties, some people argue that life is inevitable. Some people argue that life is rare. We don't know. Even if it turns out to be rare, how rare would it have to be if it didn't exist anywhere but on Earth? We found all these planets around other stars. We've only looked at the nearby stars. We have here an image. Most of the dots you see in that image are not stars. Most of the dots of light that you see on that image are galaxies, each one with about 100 billion stars. That's what our universe looks like. And you're going to tell me of all of those stars, none of them have intelligent life? Notice a couple of things about this, however. Once you start looking at stars in other galaxies, we increase the odds that there's life there, but at the same time, we also increase the odds that it's going to be so far from us, we'll never be able to communicate with it. When we say a star is 5 or 50 or 5,000 light years away, we're saying that any signal we send there will take 5 or 50 or 5,000 years to get there. That's not just our technology isn't good enough. That's a fundamental law of how the universe works. If you were able to break the light barrier, you would also, for complicated reasons that I want to go into, violate causality. You'd essentially be able to travel back in time. As far as we understand how the universe works, that doesn't happen. I mean, I love science fiction, but it doesn't happen. Now, could be we're wrong. Could be that all of our physics is wrong. Could be that our idea of causality is wrong. We don't know. Judging from what we do know now, it's not going to happen in my lifetime. Okay, up to now, we've also talked about life as we know it. We can speculate as much as we want about life as we don't know it, but you can't talk about it scientifically because we don't know. And all you can say is we don't know. There are probably more definitions of life out there than there are scientists who have come up with a definition, and that's the problem. You can't define it when you've only got one example. This is... Uh, a meteorite that was found in Antarctica in 1984. And you see those little wormy things? There are people who suggested that those might be fossilized bacteria. They found associated with that traces or the kind of organic gunk that you get when fossilized material dies, and sulfur compounds and small uh, magnetic crystals, all of which are consistent with them being tiny fossilized crystals. But I'll tell you right now, most people in the field don't think those are fossilized crystals. Because there's too many other ways that you could put all of that evidence together without resorting to life. And without having the darn stuff 
moving in front of us. We have no way of making the judgment one way or the other. The real reason I think that people are so skeptical, though, is that finding life on another planet would be such an important discovery that you really want to be sure you got it right before you announce it, and that really sure criterion, that's not scientific. It's an aesthetic, it's an intuitive, it's a gut feeling, it's a hunch. It's the hunch you have to trust. And the hunch is, hmm, probably not. Probably there's not life there. But probably there is life someplace. We're back to hunches again. Well, that's what we know from science. We can ask the question, what do we know theologically? Is the idea of life elsewhere consistent with our understanding of God and how God behaves? If there are planets out there that are suitable for life, if there is life on those planets, if that life is intelligent, if that life is in a free, self-aware, loving relationship with the Creator, if that life can communicate to us about their experience of the relationship, well, those are a lot of ifs. If so, then maybe we'd have something to talk about with each other then we might be able to talk about baptizing extraterrestrials. But if any one of that chain of ifs turns out to not be true, the entire system falls apart. And right now, we don't know. So that's why we're left with the speculation. In times past, thinkers on both sides of the religious issue have used the possibility of extraterrestrials to support whatever it is that they wanted to... Religious believers look at the universe, how grand it is, how full of life it is. God must have created life elsewhere. If we find life elsewhere, it's a proof of God's you know, creative power. Likewise, if you're an atheist and you say, ah, you think that God just created life here as soon as you know, we find life elsewhere, then that throws Christianity. It's amazing when you talk to people throughout history, you see what they write, talk to people of different religions today, Everybody agrees that when we find life elsewhere, not if, but when, that will prove that I was right all along, <laughs> regardless of what I was saying before. Um, one argument in particular I'd like to bring up. Uh, Thomas Paine, who was an American radical in 1776, he uh, argued in a book called The Age of Reason, Christianity demands either the unlikely proposition that of all the worlds in the universe, God chose to be our incarnate only in this one, because, you know, a couple of goofy people ate an apple once, or else there were so many incarnations that, and this is to quote him, the person who is irreverently called the Son of God would have nothing else to do than travel from world to world in an endless succession of death with scarcely a momentary interval of life. How do you answer that? Two different answers. One is that, of course, to the Catholics, we celebrate, we actually experience the death and resurrection of Christ in the Mass millions of times a day, a week at least. The other is that what little we know of our own religious tradition says that there was another group of intelligent creatures created by God, the angels, in our mythology. They had their own sense of trial. It didn't involve Jesus doing what he did for us. Who's to say that any race's experience and need of a salvation would be the same as ours or would be experienced the same as ours. You know, let's, let's give God a little more creative freedom. We give creative freedom to James Cameron to make movies. We could God, give God creative freedom to, to make a universe. It does, however, raise the question of uh, what the meaning of salvation actually is. 
Would another race need salvation? There's a lot of really bad science fiction stories out there about some usually Jesuit going off to another planet and discovering an unfallen race, and this shatters his faith, which, you know, uh, that's not the kind of thing that would shatter my faith, sorry. But if you found a race that never sinned, you might first then ask, are they capable of sin? And if they're not capable of sin, do they have free will? And if they don't have free will, then are they truly in the image and likeness of God? Which Thomas Aquinas tells us is intellect and free will. The ability to know that I exist, that you exist, and that I can do something about that. I can love you or I can throw a pie in your face. I have the freedom to make that choice. If you see somebody who doesn't sin, does this mean they can't? If they do sin, does this mean they're in need of salvation? Well, is there a fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth member of the Trinity going off and doing these things? According to uh, the Gospel of John, the second person, the Word, was there in the beginning. The same Word there everywhere. So whatever salvation, incarnational sense that God is in and present to these other races, it's not going to be extra members of the Trinity. It's the same second person. Which means that this salvation, this incarnation, is at most part of the same bigger incarnation of God in our universe. I tried explaining this once on Italian television. They, they invited me to come on some Italian TV show. I thought, what do I do? Well, it's the Bishop's TV. Oh, okay, I'll do that. And that we're going to have somebody who's been in space. I'm going, some nut? No, it was actually an Italian astronaut. So they asked me about this, and I'm trying to say, you know, according to the Gospel of John, we all know that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and that, that beautiful section is right at the beginning of the Gospel according to John. Except I'm doing all of this in Italian, and I'm on TV, and it's live TV, and I freeze. And I cannot remember the Italian word. I can remember the Italian word for gospel. I can remember the Italian word for beginning. I forget the Italian word for John. <laughs> and instead of saying Vangelo secondo Giovo, Gio, Giovanni, and see, I did it again, it came out and said Vangelo secondo Giove, the gospel according to Jupiter. <laughs> well, maybe in some other race they've got a gospel according to Jupiter. But it would be saying the same thing. Because just as we assume in physics that the laws of chemistry are the same everywhere and the laws of physics are the same everywhere, we also have to assume that the laws of right and wrong are the same everywhere. That whatever creatures that have intellect and free will are going to have the same temptations and things that are right for us will be right for them and things that are loving for us will be loving for them and things that break love, that reject God's love, will be rejecting for them and therefore the need for salvation will be the same. That's my assumption. Could it be more complicated than that? Of course. But I don't know how, because I'm a puny little human being. Um, Father, Father Ernan McMullen was a physicist, a philosopher. He was at Notre Dame. He once wrote that discovering extraterrestrials would inspire theologians to develop new ways to think about topics like original sin, the immortality of the soul, the meaning of Christ's redemptive act. But then he points out there's already a voluminous literature and hardly a consensus on all of those topics right now, so that would be nothing new. <laughs> uh, another uh, theologian has looked at this, Giuseppe Tanzelliniti, an astronomer who teaches theology at the Pontifical University and of the Holy Cross in Rome, writes on the extraterrestrial life in the Dizionario Interdisciplinare del Scienze Fede. He was an editor. At the end, he just writes, the last word on the question of extraterrestrial life doesn't come from theology, but science. The existence of intelligent life on planets other than Earth neither rules in nor rules out any theological principle. Theologians, just like the rest of the human race, are just going to have to wait and see. And the last word may be from this, one of my favorite comics uh, from about 40 years ago. You know, I've been reading about how maybe planets are populated with people with advanced brains, but on the other hand, 
Maybe we've got the most brains. Maybe our intellect is the most advanced. Either way, it's a sobering thought. (laughs) But the mere possibility of intelligent life elsewhere puts a human-like face on the bigger question of our place in the universe. For most of us, our lives are centered on our own immediate needs and our fears, our personal joys. But God and the meaning of our life that comes from loving God is bigger than the traffic we face, the pile of dirty laundry, the question of what's for lunch. It's bigger than our family and our problems, our city, our sports teams, our nation. Bigger than the sky or the sun or the solar system or the galaxies. Contemplating what it would mean for humans to encounter the aliens forces forces us to contemplate what it means for us to be human and for what makes them aliens. And one of the the, uh, insights you get from reading science fiction, all of these authors have dealt with other creatures and the nature of other creatures. The one insight in all of their stories is that any creature in this universe created and loved by the same God who creates and loves us is subject to those same issues moral and human issues that we're faced with. And incidentally, all three of those authors, um, some of the most famous and well-known, happen to be practicing Catholics. So, when I baptize an extraterrestrial. The question came up, really, for the first time in 2009, in a very direct way, when I was in Birmingham, attending the British Science Conference, and I was going to give some talks on asteroids, and they said, could you do an interview, um, you know, very informal setting, do an interview with a couple of newspapermen to publicize? So I said, sure. They call me up Friday morning before I'm about to give the talk, except that happens to be exactly the same day that Pope Benedict is also in Birmingham. So what they're really interested in is stories about, you work for the Pope. Have you ever talked to the Pope? Well, yeah, actually, I'd seen him like a week earlier. He had come to dedicate our new uh, observatory. So where do you disagree the most with the Pope? I'm going, what do you mean, where do I disagree with? You know, how has he tried to undermine you? What do you mean, how has he he just built us a new observatory? That's what's undermined. They're trying to get a story out of me, and I wasn't giving them a story. So finally, one of them comes up with what he thinks is the killer question. Would you baptize an extraterrestrial? (laughs) What a stupid question is that? So I popped off with the first thing that I came up with. Would I baptize an extraterrestrial? Only if they ask. (laughs) You know, and and, because right there is summed up the whole thing. Tell me when there's one who can talk to me and we'll, we'll deal with it. They laughed, just like you laughed. The next day, it's all reported in the papers as if this was some serious answer. (laughs) But the interesting thing is, that question, would you baptize an extraterrestrial, can be read in a couple of different ways. You know, would you baptize an alien? Or would you baptize an alien, as opposed to somebody else baptizing one. People think of baptism sometimes as if it was, you know, welcome to the club, like the dog running across the the, the, the crowded street. All right, Rusty's in the club. But that's not what baptism is about. That's not what Christianity is about. If it's Christianity, those dogs are out there helping him get across the street not waiting to see if he can do it on his own. Another thing about that question. Every time I'm out there, I keep getting the same question, even though I come up with all sorts of different answers. It's a question I keep getting, which makes me think maybe it's not really the question. Maybe would you baptize E.T.? isn't the right question. Maybe we should look 
to the way that Jesus dealt with the aliens, us, here on earth, of which he was also one of us. Am I willing to have a meal with an extraterrestrial? Am I willing to let the E.T. share a meal with me? If I saw E.T. sick and injured by the side of the road, would I do something to help them out? Would the E.T. do the same for me? Am I willing to suffer or die for an E.T.? Is the E.T. willing to suffer or die for me? If the answer to those questions is yes, then frankly, that's what's going on in that movie, if you think about it. Then we can talk about being common members in the kingdom of God. Those questions that the reporters were throwing at me, and especially that last question, would you baptize an ET, it was designed to be a trick question. Because if I said, yes, I'd baptize the ET, then they're saying, what an arrogant fool that you would think that your puny planet and your puny idea of God is something that you're going to force on somebody smart enough to travel across the universe. If I had said no, they're going to say, aha, uh -huh, you're a ridiculous, home, you know, crazy religion is obviously just fit for the yokels back on Earth and doesn't have any cosmic significance. There's no way you can answer the question and win, right? Great trick question. So you turn it around. The question isn't about what I would do. The question is, would E.T. ask? Because if someone who is able to travel across the universe comes to us and says, yes, we can learn from you, then that will give us a sense of what we have that's worth sharing with the universe. Usually, the Christian idea that humanity is at the center of God's love and concern is taken to mean that of all the universe, God has chosen human beings out to be special and separate and different from the rest of the universe. But maybe, maybe that's not really the way it works. If you are in love, with your spouse, with your job, with the universe, with whatever it is that you love. That love doesn't cut off the rest of the universe. It makes you love the rest of the universe more. Love doesn't exclude, it includes. If that's true of human love, that must be even more true of God's love. When God falls in love with us, God treats the entire universe better. God treats everything in the universe as if he has fallen in love with it. It's not fair. It's not consistent. It's more than fair. It's more than consistent. What if whatever it is that God loves about us is not something that separates us from the universe, but something that is characteristic of the universe itself? We humans are, among other things, material, feeling, thinking, willing, free, loving. In us, the universe has become self-aware. In us, the universe has the ability to make free choices. Actually, I can't say that's true of humanity. I have to say that's true of me. And also her, and also him, and also her, not too sure about you, but about him. <laughs> Each individual, every individual, is in this kind of relationship with the universe, and it is these characteristics which are characteristic of us and characteristic, perhaps, of the entire universe. All of us, whatever planet or place we come from, whatever space or time we happen to be inhabiting, we are the bearers of the purpose for which the universe exists. That makes us, each of us, the center of the universe. It was for us that Christ died. It was for us 
that the universe was born. I've commented about how the search for life elsewhere is an exercise in the imagination, a speculation served by science fiction, by poetry. I want to end with this, one of my favorite poems, written by uh, Alice Maynell, who published this in 1917, which was 10 years before the first science fiction magazine. With this ambiguous earth, his dealings have told us, these abide, the signal to a maid, the human birth, the lesson, and the young man crucified. But not a star of all the innumerable host of stars has heard how he administered this terrestrial ball. Our race have kept their lords a trusted word. Of his earth visiting feet, none knows his secret cherished, perilous, terrible, shamefast, frightened, whispered, sweet, heart shattering secret of his way with us. Nor in our little day may his devices with the heavens be guessed, his pilgrimage to thread the Milky Way, or his bestowals there be manifest. But in the eternities, doubtless we shall compare together, hear a million alien gospels, in what guise he trod the Pleiades, the lyre, the bear. Oh, be prepared, my soul, to read the inconceivable, to scan the million forms of God those stars unroll, when we in turn, we show to them. Amen. Thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you for coming all the way from Rome to speak to us. We're very honoured to have you here. Thanks. Um, I'm sure there are lots of people with questions. Um, at least I'm hoping there are lots of people <laughs> with questions. Um, do you want to stick your hands up and I'll try and manage it? Or maybe there aren't any. Oh, oh, oh yes, there are. Um, so start things start, off in the back. Start one, two, yeah. Okay. Uh, first, yeah, and then the shout so we can hear you. Yes, I forgot to ask for a mic, sorry. Right. <laughs> it's one of the sad things of human life, you know, we, we've done this before, as you're pointing out. A lot of the speculation that comes from the Middle Ages was first, what if there was uh, life on the other side of the earth, on the other side of the Sahara Desert that they thought they would never be able to cross? Would they actually be children of Adam and Eve? And then when uh, other races were found in the Americas and in the Far East, there was a great debate in the 1500s as to whether or not these people should be made slaves or whether they should uh, be baptized. And one of the sad things is that we do tend to make our mistakes over and over again. I'm sure there will be a lot of those mistakes. We probably will have the opportunity to make new mistakes. One of the things that uh, I did in my own life was to spend a couple of years living in the Peace Corps, living in remote parts of Africa. And I came there as an American, very, very sensitive to this materialistic culture I had lived in. 
and hoping to learn something from the people I lived in who had lived a much simpler life. And all of that happened. But I also saw that the first thing that these people did was to say, he wears blue jeans. Let's all get blue jeans. And, and that there was a great hunger to imitate everything that I'm most embarrassed about in being an American. Or the first, you know, it's, it's human nature. It is our fallen nature. We can only hope that we will learn to not make quite the same mistakes the next time that we made that time. But it is, to, to use a phrase we used before, a sobering thought. The difference is that unmistakably, every intelligent people we've discovered in the surface of the earth have been genetically identical to us. How does this play out in a case where they've got obviously different DNA? That's what will be new. And that is, I think, one of the sources of the great um, mystery of how does God relate to them compared to us. There is a great temptation in the modern world to separate the mind from the body, to say that only the soul matters. I think that's a mistake. That's the kind of thinking that allows people to think that I can go into the doctor and have them change you know, my my shape, my nose, my face, my race. And you wind up being sort of uh, a weird creature like Michael Jackson. I think it's important to remember that we are created physical beings and the physical side of us is also important. How that plays out in our salvation, I don't know. And it's wonderful to speculate about. In the back, yes. It thinks about them, but not in a systematic way. And you have to remember the nature of these questions. I had a philosophy professor who pointed out there are two kinds of questions in the world. There are questions like, do I have enough money in my pocket to buy a candy bar? Once you know the answer to that question, it's not interesting anymore. But there are the other kinds of questions that even though I could come up with an answer today, they'll still be interesting 10 years from now. What is it about chocolate that I really want so much? And those questions will never be answered. There will be more mysteries to contemplate. In the absence of the data, it would certainly be premature to make any kind of definitive statements. And yet you can see through the history of, of church writings, yeah, I can show you quotations in Time magazine from 1955 where they're asking, would you baptize an extraterrestrial? That question is not new. And the answer is always the same. Well, at the moment, knowing what we don't know, you can't rule it out. But you can't rule it in. It's more a question of contemplation over a beer at night than it is something that we have enough data to actually make a serious attempt at understanding right now. Yes. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For somebody first. Yeah. No, no, the gentleman at the back and then the gentleman. Okay, the gentleman in the back and then somebody up front. Okay. Right. Yeah. Well, it's the. Uh, the idea is that uh, our universe has a number of physical constants that make all the laws of physics work, which are just right to allow the kind of chemical reactions that make organic chemistry possible and that make organic chemicals possible because the stars are around long enough. And it's these long chain of very, very special coincidences. Some people have used this as an argument to say, aha, there must have been a god. But it could be that we're just one of an infinite number of multiverses and we happen to be the only one that has life possible because if life wasn't possible, we wouldn't be here. I think it's a dangerous argument to use to prove God. If you're using science to prove God, then next year's science could fall apart and then suddenly you don't have any reason to believe in God anymore if that was your only reason to believe in God. 
It's called the God of the gaps. It's bad theology. Ultimately, it leads to losing faith in God. If there are an infinite number of universes, the role of God as creator of universes is to set the reason why are there any laws of physics in the first place? Why are there any universes in the first place? Um, let me give you an illustration. Do you remember years ago there was a game called Mousetrap? And you had this really ridic ridiculous say, chain of events that would cause a little trap to come down and, and you could set it all up. Some people want to think that God is the guy who turns the crank that makes everything work. No. God is the guy back at the ideal toy company who thought up the idea of having a game called Mousetrap. So I think the idea of multiverses as an escape clause to try to get around the necessity for a god who fine-tuned the universe is a highly speculative bit of physics to get around a really bad piece of theology. <laughs> who else will you choose? There's, there's something here and then something here. Okay, all right. And then something going to All right. I'm going to say thank you for some fascinating material. Um, to be fair, my background is physics, really, dark science and engineering. Um, I find the interaction between theology and physics fascinating. There are two possible passages that grab my attention, and I wonder if you'd like to comment on them. But the first is the feeling of high ground, that the thought comes ready for massacre. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. kilograms requires a lot of energy. And if you think some of the words are still ancient, uh, the other one in Newton heard just recently about drinking the new wine in heaven, which implies at least a pure one and a controlled one. Um, but does heaven have an arrow of time and mm -hmm. operation of energy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's wonderful, and, and you could write great stories. You could write fake, great fantasy stories, taking either any one of those. Uh, there is a uh, rather scatological story that uh, Larry Niven, art article, I should say, about Superman. And uh, without getting too graphic, I'll merely mention the title of the story is Man of Steel, Woman of Kleenex. If you take any of these marvelous ideas and push them too far, you realize that can't possibly work. Which means that we've understood the question wrong. And to say that, uh, well, Jesus was doing it only in a spiritual sense also gets the question wrong, also begs the question. There is more going on than what we understand. And that's fun, because I'm always happy to admit I have no idea what's going on. Who else? Hey, that's what that's what happens when you get infinity. Yeah. <laughs> not, even, not even the multiverse. I mean, right. you, you the, the universe itself, but where it now is infinite, eventually that thing could be born into the earth. Into mm -hmm. the earth. Well, well I, there is there are people who say that every quantum choice splits the universe. Yeah. And since there are how many zillion atoms undergoing how many different quantum choices every blank second, but then when you're dealing with infinites, you can't say no. Um, it doesn't seem to devalue our place to have lots of people. If anything, it makes each of us in some way more important. And I don't know how that works, but that's how love works. So maybe the answer is there. I'm, I'm, we're running out, uh, I'm running out of, of steam and energy, but we'll certainly take one more, yes.
Well, according to the gospel, according to Jupiter, <laughs> uh, the, the gospel, according to John, starts, in the beginning was the word. Not that in the beginning God made the word, but rather was already. The second person is the incarnation. Um, I have a feeling that's one of those, not how much money do I have in my pocket questions, but one of those questions that you can contemplate and take to prayer for years without ever coming up with a definitive answer. The more you think about it, the more amazing it is. The more you think about what the incarnation means, the more astonishing it is. But our clue is to actually look at the nature of the incarnation itself, that God did not come to earth dressed up, you know, a deity dressed up in a man suit with enormous power on a cloud of light saying, hey, everybody, listen. He didn't come to the most important you know, city in the world. He didn't come to London. <laughs> he came as a poor techie in a backwater conquered nation as an innocent child who didn't live to see 35. and who lived a particular time and a particular life, as the theologians refer to, the scandal of particularity. This is the way that God works. And that's something that you can contemplate. And maybe works in particular ways with other particular races in ways that we'll never be able to share because we can't possibly communicate. But then, a thousand years ago, could people have contemplated a conversation like this in a room like this? So, who knows where we'll be a thousand years from now. I have a train to catch, so <laughs> thank you, speaking of a thousand years from now. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>